We're here today, it's the Sunday the 17th, I believe, of uh, June in Marlborough. With a picture here of the town. Wonderful town, very near to Stonehenge, Avery, um, Wiltshire, crop circles, all sorts of wonderful things go on around this part of the world. Um, it's a, a lovely little corner of England, may it ever stay so, but not if the EU has its way. And we're here today to hear Donald Martin in the town hall. So we'll go over to the town hall now and uh, join them for the meeting. We've got Donald Martin speaking to us, who's a um, publisher. And I don't know if you can see a wonderful array of books here. He's a very learned man indeed. We're going to learn a lot today. Um, he's going to talk to about the monetary system, which is very, very important in the banking system, the bankers, how it affects us and what it really is. These are just some of the books here that uh, he's brought today. A terrific array. Very, very knowledgeable person. He has roots in uh, Australia, and he's going to tell us a little about the picture in Australia also um, in the 60s and 70s. Even more books here. <laughs> Already many have been bought. Nearly sold out of that one, though. Christopher's Story, Richard North, The Great Deception. Brilliant book about the European Union. House of Bush and the House of Saudi. Connections in America. Secret rulers of the world. Which uh, information of which is getting more and more into public gaze now. We're finding out more about it. Fourth Life of the Rich, Tragedy and Hope. The Nameless War, The Selling of America. Because as we know, this is happening in America as it's happening in our country here but they're turning it into an American Union. And recently, um, we've been over there taking films of people in America also telling us their side of the story. Different treaties, NAFTA, GAFTA, NAFTA, GATS. Um, SPP is the latest one. All these um, treaties, just the same as the European treaties. But, however, we're here today to listen to John of Martin. And uh, it's going to be a really, really interesting talk, so I'll go over to him in just a moment. We're just getting ready for the talk. More than kind uh, introduction. I could feel, although I wasn't looking in that direction, my wife smiling at the back as the different activities uh, were mentioned because she has been reminding me on the odd occasion that now we're in our 70s, can't catch up with you yet, uh, Harry. She wouldn't mind seeing some of the relatives a little bit more and wouldn't mind doing some of the things we want to do rather than some of the things we have to do. Some of the things we want to do, of course, is get out, certainly get out of the uh, European Union. But in approaching this uh, talk this afternoon, Robert said, well, could you say how you got involved, how you got interested? You know, it might be interesting for people to, to know what started you all off. And so a little bit of this is in that, but I will interweave the other things with it because that's part of my progression to understanding what the uh, European Union is all about and what are the underlying things which we must look at, particularly if we're going to be successful in getting out. And I'm sorry to make a correction, Harry. It's not Suffolk UKIP, it's South Suffolk UKIP, because UKIP is very active in the eastern counties, uh, and they have plenty of other uh, committees in Suffolk as well. Uh, so it's only South Suffolk. That was enough, I can tell you. It's a, it's a fairly large rural area, as a number of you would know from coming here. And one of the things you will uh, notice in this sort of travel of how I became involved, that finance will enter the picture fairly regularly. And one of the interesting things about finance is that 
particularly during my days with the Federation of Small Businesses when I was a director for over 15 years and uh, at the end a policy director, is I had a lot to do with banks. In fact, one of the other areas I gave evidence was to the Competition Commission, which finished up in that huge report from a gentleman whose name who slips my mind at the moment, where, of course, is one of the reasons why the banks are under pressure at the moment on a lot of their overcharging, not only personal customers, but particularly small business customers. And I have to say that some of the best jokes about bankers I get from bankers. And I can't help but want to share this one with you right at the start. And this is the story of the small businessman who goes into the bank one morning, goes up to the counter and says, I'd like to see the manager, please. And the receptionist turns around and says, well, I'm sorry, sir, you can't. He died last week. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, says the small businessman and goes his way. That was Monday. Tuesday morning, he goes into the bank again. He goes up to the receptionist and he says, sir, I'd like to see the manager, please. And the receptionist looks at him rather peculiarly and says, sir, but sir, I told you yesterday that he died last week. And you can't see him, therefore. Oh, yes, he says. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, he says. And he goes out. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he comes back on Wednesday and he comes back on Thursday as well, asking the same question. And, of course, needless to say, the uh, poor receptionist is getting a little upset with this. And when he comes in on Friday, and he goes up and he says, well, I'd like to see the manager, please. Well, the receptionist just sort of slips away and the assistant manager comes in and says, well, look, sir, I've had the report, you've been in every day this week and you've come in and you've asked the same question. Well, you know, really, what are you up to? You know, there's something, you, there's something quite clearly going on here. Why are you coming asking this same question every day? Oh, he said, don't get worried, he said. He said, it's just that I love to hear you say it. <laughs> Which, of course, points out one of the, uh, one of the feelings that uh, a lot of small businessmen have of their bank managers, nothing personal in it of course, it's just that they happen to be the instrument of the bank and who quite often is very ruthless, particularly when it comes to overdrafts on demand and they're not too satisfied and they know there's some assets there and they'd sooner have the asset and sell it at a, a far side price and get their money back. But I'll come back, I'll come back to that uh, bank, you know, just to show you they're not too bad, uh, I'll mention it later. But. Uh, you will find finance is right underneath this. The whole question of the European Union, which we'll come to later, the question of finance comes into it. But when I first went out to uh, Australia in 1956, I happened to uh, finish up boarding a, 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 an English lady took in boarders and there were two Scots there, already there, and I, I filled the first, third vacancy. And it was here that I got involved with two things. First of all, with the Young Liberal Movement. Um, one of the gentlemen there was director of what was called their Winter School of Political Science, and he asked if I would be treasurer, so that was another job I got for a short while. And on this particular occasion, this year at the Winter School, which was always on the Queen's birthday, that's the official Queen's birthday holiday in Australia, where they have it in the, usually, the, I think it's the second um, weekend in, in June, on the Monday. And the, it was an interesting subject, the first one. It was called The Problems of Survival in an Apathetic World. You might just say it's the problems of survival of Britain trying to get out of the European Union with an apathetic public, isn't it? Yeah, right. So this time it was the problems of survival in an apathetic world. But the underlying theme at that time, if you remember, of course, it's round about it's between the uh, Korean War and the Vietnam War is just getting, under, getting um, started. The theme was communism and the spread of communism worldwide. And so, in fact, the speakers, one of them happened to be the director of the Victorian League of Rights, before it was the Australian League of Rights, who was one of the speakers. Um, he was dealing with the communist question and so, in fact, was a person who was a member of two members of the federal parliament, one by the name of James, James Killen, who in that fact became Sir James Killen and was defence minister in the federal government for a few years. And the other was a quite eccentric gentleman by the name of William Wentworth, 
he proved, uh, he wanted to prove that the security in Sydney Harbour wasn't too great and actually at the, early in the war got through all the defences and then of course made a huge row about it, um, having demonstrated the point. But he was quite a fiery, independent-minded member of parliament and he didn't mind speaking his mind on many questions. And one of the things in discovering the whole question of communism, which I learnt about, was very interesting. And it comes back to the question of why do people become communists? Now, you, you know, why mention it now? I mention it now because communism as a name has almost vanished. But the communists are there under different labels. And they're still following the same philosophical approach that they've always followed. And this is where I want to pick up, and this flows through lots of things, what is the philosophical approach? You either have the will to freedom or the will to tyranny. And I think you've got to bear this particular point in mind. And every policy that is put forward in society, I think you would need to look and examine which way does it lead? What's the basis of it? Is it centralization or is it decentralization? What's the European Union? Centralization, isn't it? And I'll come back to some of the other features of that later. And the other person in Australia, very interesting gentleman that I met, and led, this led me into another line and picks up the theme of finance that I was referring to earlier, was a gentleman by the name of Bill, no Bill Noakes. And he, in fact, was a retired inspector of police. And he ran in Brisbane, where I was in Queensland, what was called the Social Credit Bookshop. Very interesting gentleman because he had a lot of the works of C.H. Douglas, which are on the table uh, at the back, and dealing with a lot of questions of finance, but also a lot of philosophical questions. And the will to freedom, the will to tyranny um, that I referred to earlier, um, those are the points which I particularly got from C.H. Douglas via this retired police inspector. And he also pointed out a number of books that there are people who in fact have the interest in what I referred to as the will to dictatorship, but the will to power. In fact, it was, I couldn't think of the right word before. It's the will to power. The will to freedom or the will to power. And it's important to, to, to remember those points, as, as I said before. And so I started to learn a lot more about finance. And that has always interested me because I suppose I've, apart from being treasurer of the things, various things and various bodies over the years, uh, I've also done a certain amount of accountancy training until I got too busy to finish off the exams. Anyway, I was doing the job in industry by then, so I wasn't worried in having the qualifications. That was, uh, uh, that was by the board. So I only got a limited number. But it also came to look at this communist question alongside this, because apart from the philosophical point that I've referred to, the other interesting point that you must bear in mind is that no revolution in history, certainly no communist revolution anywhere in the world, has ever come to be without big financial backing. Every revolution in history needs big financial backing. Dealing with the European Union and the establishment of what was initially called the common market had big financial backing. A lot of that came from America, in fact, from big financial sources in the United States of America. And you've got one gentleman who was a member of parliament who lives not far from here by the name of Sir Richard Boddy, probably known to many of you. And he knows the background of this and the financing of a lot of the European movement campaign. And of course, if you wanted to have a look at the European movement and go through the days when they used to produce a list of their corporate members who used to be their big financial ba backers. And who were they? They were all big in the main, big financial institutions, multinational companies. The banks were there. The nationalized industries as they were then before they became pri privatized, they were there financing the campaign to drive us into the European Union. There you are, see, there's the financial backing. The fact that the European movement is, I'm not sure whether it's totally folded or just hanging on now or not, 
is because they're not interested in, in that organization now uh, so much because they feel they've achieved what they wanted to achieve by getting us trapped within it. But of course the, tra the cracks are starting to appear in the European Union, but we'll come back to that later. And so we get this, this theme, as I said, which I, I picked up in Australia. And I always remember an occasion, one time when I was in the equivalent of Speaker's Corner, which was Centenary Park in Brisbane, and there was a young man speaking there in support of the Australian troops being in Vietnam, and he was getting quite a heckling. And there were quite clearly one or two Communist Party people there. In fact, I recognized them from having been along to their bookshop to get some books, because if you want to learn about them, the best place to get it is from them quite often. And they turned on him and they said, look, young man, you want to support the Australian troops, all this up there in Vietnam. You're fit and young. Why aren't you up there fighting? And he stumbled over that particular point. And I thought, hmm, yes. Since I was talking on this same question around Queensland, I thought, uh, yes, I'll have to um, face that question sometime myself. I better have an answer ready. It isn't interesting, isn't it? If you have an answer ready, you don't get the question quite <laughs> often. It was the best part of two years before they got that question. And I can remember it was out in a country town and I virtually wanted to leap off the platform, go down to the person in the audience, say, thank you, thank you, I've been waiting two years for this question. I'll tell you, I said, why I'm not up in Vietnam fighting the war there, because the place where the real war is being fought is not in Vietnam, it's here in Australia, it's in America, it's in Britain, it's in, it's in all the other places who are attempting to stand up for freedom, where they are in fact undermining it to make sure that the policy can't be followed through. Well, I'm not going to go into the rights and wrongs of involvement in the Vietnam War, but the subversion is usually within. So where, whilst the finance dealing with the European Union has come from without, as well as from multinational and big companies, the work has been done by people within. And why, in fact, is the interesting point. And we'll come back to this. Why? Why do they become involved? I don't know how many people here, if I mention the name Igor Gazenko, would know what I'm talking about. Anybody? Harry? Oh yes, well you, you've been reading some of the books from me, haven't you? <laughs> well Igor Gazenko is a very interesting gentleman. He was a cipher clerk in the Russian Embassy in Canada. And from his family background, he must have had a little bit of Christianity left in, in him from his family. And he got so disgusted with what he was having to do in feeding all this information from very prominent people, including members of parliament and scientists and very wealthy people in Canada, who were supplying all this information through the Communist Party and direct to their handlers, and of course it was going to the Soviet Union, that he decided he must do something about it and he decided he was going to defect. And he did defect. And if anybody wants to ask the story of his defection, that in itself is quite an interesting story and very difficult. He had great difficulty defecting. But I won't go into that for the moment, if, unless you want to ask questions about it. At the end, he did defect. And at the same time, there was a Royal Commission inquiry because of the information which he brought. And that Royal Commission inquiry, which is their report is, you know, quite a thick, you know, like so many of these Royal Commissions, they're very thick reports. But there's a very important chapter in that report. And what is the report? The section I'm referring to, it's dealing with ideological conversion. All these prominent people that I referred to earlier, they weren't being paid a penny to support the Soviet Union. They had been ideologically converted to the international ideal of what was then known widely as international communism. They believed that it was their duty to support the Soviet Union. It was their duty to help the spread of communism. 
throughout the world. They believed that, and that's why they did it, not for any financial support, money in any way. There are those who, who use money, of course, and need it, and those who get trapped to supply, but that's a, di that's a different story. These key people, it was ideological conversion. And so, you find <coughs> that if you look at this, it's the ideology which gets people involved. And if you wanted to look at it just purely from the communist point of view and understanding it, and it still has application in society today, there's one particular book by an Australian medical doctor who spent a lot of time in, in the United States of America by the name of Dr. Fred Swartz, a medical doctor, but he spent most of his time running what was known as the Christian Anti-Communist Crusade. And he wrote a book, and the title of the book is You Can Trust the Communists, brackets, to be communists, brackets. And that's a matter of understanding their whole philosophy, their approach, how they go about things, how that lying and murder and deception is perfectly acceptable, provided it advances communism. In other words, the correct ideological end result. And it's an excellent book because it explains it right through. There's only one sentence in the book with which I would disagree. And that is that he, in fact, says how wrong Karl Marx was to say that capitalism had the seeds of its own destruction. In fact, I think Karl Marx was absolutely dead right in that statement. And I'll come to why a little later, because it's, as I said, it's the underlying theme at dealing with the whole question of the European Union. And so then, just dealing a little with one or two other points in Australia, and some of the lessons that I learnt whilst I was out there, That's an interesting flavoured water. Hmm. Oh, that's what it was. And what I saw while I was out there was the process which was used to destroy a lot of small businesses, <coughs> to destroy a lot of farmers. And here you see that theme, the will to power, the will to freedom coming in. Farmers were told by government advisers, if they had small farms, you must get out of farming, or alternatively you must borrow money from the bank and buy out your neighbour and get bigger. It was get bigger or get out was the theme. And I can remember going round talking on this round on us in Australia. This was a constant process which was going on and the banks cooperated with it because if they were they would look at just their normal financial rules and I can understand this from my accountancy training. They'd say yes, you know, you're not viable, you're only just hanging on, you better get out. And you can understand the farmers from getting out, but it was the finance, and I'll come back to this and the reasons why a little later. So it was the finance which was driving the centralization of farming. And not only did you get the centralization of farming, but then you got the corporate farmers coming in. Those, uh, many corporations using farming as a tax deduction. And they've done the same in this country, haven't they? as I've found from coming back here. Then also we had something else which I saw it going on in Australia. It uh, wasn't terribly far advanced when I came back in 1970, but I then picked up the theme here, and that was the progressive centralisation of government in local government, reorganisation. Get rid of the smaller units. When they're too close to the people, they might actually do what the people wanted locally. How disgusting! And what did we see in the 1970s? Wholesale reorganisation. What's on now? Wanting more unitary authorities. And what's usually the excuse? Well, they'd be more economic. More economically viable. It would save taxpayers money. Hands up anybody whose rates have gone down as a result of local government reorganisation. I mean, it, it's a myth, isn't it? But they put it forward every time and it's swallowed every time. It's like the other one on metrication, isn't it? I can remember lecturing on one occasion across the United States of America and I just happened to casually mention how, in fact, we were being encouraged 
in the United Kingdom to go for metrication. How they were encouraged in New Zealand to do the same, in Australia to do the same, and in Canada to do the same. And why were we all being encouraged? Well, because the United States were doing it. And the Americans said to me, well, actually, we're being encouraged to do it because you're doing it. <laughs> so they tell, you know, the campaign was telling everybody else that, uh, but it was going the other way. Now, of course, the European Commission has very kindly said us we can keep our imperial measures for, uh, for the time being, at least, uh, because we needed to trade for, with America. It's taken them a long time to found that out, hasn't it? But there we are. Uh, that's part of the process, the, the will to power and also the process of centralizing to get everybody doing the same thing. And there are many other areas that you can look at on reorganization. Some people here probably know when the Treaty of Rome was signed, don't you? Do you remember the year? 75. No. 75, you're thinking of the referendum, aren't you? No. No. Sorry? 57, that's right. I think it was the 25th of March, 57, the Treaty of Rome. Do you remember I referred to this retired peace police inspector, Bill Noakes, that I went to see and the bookshop? He had some very interesting books, and one of them dealt with regionalization of the world, how they were going to be formed, common markets and regional organizations in different parts. And do you know when I was reading this? This is one of the things, early things, I was reading this in 1956. <laughs> Nearly a year, it was six months actually, because it was the end of 56, six months before the Treaty of Rome was signed. And I can remember writing back to my sister here in, I think it was about 1960, asking if she would get for me 12 copies of the Treaty of Rome. The letter came back, what's that? And where do I get it? Because there was no official edition in English at that, at that time. It was the French and German editions which were the official ones. And so, in fact, you see the planning for this has been there for a long time. And there's one very interesting speech which is reproduced in a publication on the table on the corner there by a gentleman by the name of Arnold Toynbee, Professor Arnold Toynbee. How many people have heard of this gentleman? Quite a few, yes, yeah, I can see you're well informed here. And you know, you probably know the mess little message in the middle of this speech in 1931 in Copenhagen. He said, we are doing with our hands what we are denying with our lips, or we might have said it the other way around, we are denying with our lips what we're doing with our hands. And what was he talking about? He was talking about slaying this dragon called national sovereignty and how we had to get rid of the sovereignty of nation states. Well, it's interesting to know that uh, when he was giving this speech, he was also the director of research in the Foreign Office. You know, as Enoch Powell said, yes, it's the Foreign Office. They're for it's certainly foreign to us. <laughs> and they look after foreign interests rather than ours. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. Yes, he did. Yes, a nest of vipers uh, and also a den of traitors, I think, was the other part of that. And so, but here you see, here's Arnold Toynbee in that key position and then went on to be a director at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. But that's the theme he's selling. And why? because they weren't economic units, they weren't big enough, you had to have them in larger units. And the ultimate plan, of course, is world government. Don't just accept it from me, because many of those on the other side have said precisely this. I can remember when I came back from Australia in 1970, I got hold of a speaker's manual from the European movement. And on page 27, there was a little statement which said, this unique European experiment of pooling national sovereignty is being copied in other parts of the world and could ultimately provide a blueprint for the establishment of world government by consent instead of conquest. When too many of us campaigning in the lead up to the parliamentary vote, 
on the European Communities Bill, as well as the referendum in 1975, were quoting this, all of a sudden that speaker's manual vanished. And I can remember one time, and I was in the audience of a television program in, in Norwich, and I thought I'd take this little booklet along with me. And I quoted this because there was the director of the European movement on the panel. And he poo-pooed, he said, no, he said, the European movement would never say such a thing. <laughs> At which stage, of course, I held up for the camera. <coughs> I said, well, it's funny you should say that. I've actually happened to have a copy of it here with me at that occasion. He didn't say another word after that. Again, you see the theme, isn't it? It's the philosophical conversion to an international ideal, the progressive centralization of power. Indeed, I was uh, telling somebody the other day on this particular point, when I was in Canada, I finished up going along to... Um, with a colleague who was organising a speaking tour for me to a radio station. They have a lot of these talk-in programmes. Every little town you go to across Canada seems to have radio stations as well as television stations. It's quite exhausting, I can tell you. Anyway, I was going to be on for one of these phone-in programmes for, for an hour, but because there was a lot of snow and ice, we'd got ahead and been fairly early, and so I was there, we were there over an hour early and uh, my colleague happened to be friends of the person who was comparing the program and he came out and uh, met us and said well I've got another guest on an hour before you um, he said um, he happens to be the Canadian director of the world federalist movement and he's coming along to speak on the question of world government he says does world government have anything to do with the common market well I said it happens to be one of their objectives um, a, a, as a staging stone uh, stepping stone I should say uh, on this process Oh, he said, would you mind um, coming on the program with him as well? So I said, no, quite happy on that, to do that. And so I were. The gentleman from the World Federalist must have been rather upset that he didn't have the program to himself. Anyway, I politely let him put his cards on the table and tell, him, tell us all and the audience what he was about and what he was seeking to achieve. And then I thought, well, I better have something simple which people can pick up. And I said, well, it's very interesting to have this ideal of world government. But I said, how can you stop world government from becoming a tyranny? Because every time we've seen the progressive centralization of power in lots of times in different federations, it's resulted in wars and tyrannies. I mean, we, it's often said we haven't had any wars since the Second World War. Well, a lot of those wars have been as a result of the breakup of federations, haven't they? And I said, how do you stop, therefore, world government becoming a tyranny because of the centralization of power? How do you stop it from becoming remote to the individual? And much to my surprise, he turned around and said in reply, he said, that, he said, that is one of the difficulties. <laughs> I thought to myself, what an understatement. And then we had a discussion on that, and he hadn't got any answers. In other words, he was ideologically converted to this, this approach, but he hadn't really thought it through. And the interesting thing, and the reason for picking up these simple points to pointing out on these, is that when he had left the program, and it was my hour, we had, most of that was actually taken up with phone calls. And I would say that something like 80 to 90% of the calls picked up that simple theme. How do you stop it from becoming a tyranny when you centralise power? How do you stop individuals becoming unimportant to those in control of the structure? And it was very interesting. That just the simple theme, don't, none company, I didn't, bring, I, I didn't bring anything else into it, I just kept that simple theme there. And uh, as I say, the, uh, the lines were running hot, in fact, uh, we had to stop, the programme had to stop before we could deal with all the telephone calls, which is in itself encouraging. Anyway, let's now come back. I'm back in England now in 1970 and we have 1970s of course we saw the reorganization of local government and we're seeing it now as we know. I don't know if you've got it in this part of the world. In, over in East Anglia we've got uh, a, a dirty little trick because they tried to get us to do it a few years back and get all our district councils to uh, amalgamate into unitary authorities and 
uh, there was a revolt and they decided to step back and they, they, they shelved it for a while. What's, what's the tack this time? The tack this time, of course, is to try to divide the community. So what are they doing? For Norfolk and Suffolk, they've got uh, persuaded Norwich and Ipswich, the two county capitals, so to speak, county towns of uh, Norfolk and Suffolk, to go for unitary authority and to take over a lot of the functions of the county council because they want to get rid of the county councils. That's the objective. <coughs> it's, it fits in with the European Union, of course, but you have to, they don't tell you that, um, but this is what it does. And so by doing that, of course, they hope, therefore, to push ahead with that um, whilst at the same time they've got opposition to the, from the county council and all the district councils. So that's the battle we've got in our part of the world. As I say, I don't, don't know your part of uh, the world as far as unitary authorities are concerned. But what is, the, uh, what is the objective? Why do they want the unitary authorities? Because it's going to cost more money, like the, all the others have pre previously. And in fact, the government itself admitted in the last few weeks, haven't they, that they haven't got enough money to do, to do reorganisation of local government on a wholesale basis, so they're going to pick out a few specialist ones, select ones instead, and save the others for later. Now, you know, if they want all this extra money to do it, how's it going to be more economical? Oh, well, it's got to do it in the long term. But if you examine the sums, it doesn't add up in the long term. But what's its purpose? Well, it ties in with the Europe of the regions. And what do they want? They want the 12 regions of the United Kingdom to have sub-regions, and the sub-regions should be the unitary authorities, and they want to have sub-sub-regions. And what are the sub-sub-regions? Well, those should be your parish councils, which they hope to give them a few more powers than looking after the churchyards and the footpaths and the church clocks, which is what, you know, they've got grand town councils, and I don't know if you, we've certainly got them in our part of the world, in Sudbury, where I live, the town council is re really only a parish council, and that's all it's responsible for. Um, but we keep all the trappings there as if it's, you know, something really important, but in fact it's not. But they want to give them a few more things to look after, um, so to give it, suppose, a little bit of more importance, but the higher rungs will have control, particularly of finance, because the instrument of coercion on local authorities have been financed, because most of the income for local authorities comes from central government, not from taxpayers, not from council taxpayers, no, it comes from central government. They give them more tasks and they give them a bit of money, not the money to run it all, so that's why they have to keep pushing the, the council tax up that, that much more, uh, because they want it to go in that particular direction and they want to push it off onto the taxpayer at a local level. So it's not the fault of the district council, the county council and the police authority, it's because the central government keeps pushing more and more things, and in the case of the police, of course, they keep pushing more and more crimes, don't they? Not more and more criminals, more and more crimes. You know, it's going to be a criminal offence to smoke. Well, I'm not going to get into the smoking or non-smoking. I happen to be a non-smoker, but, um, you know, that's... Uh, and if you throw... Uh, it, next stage is if you stub a cigarette out on a, on a footpath. That's going to be a criminal offence. Well, they'll get your DNA that way and uh, have your fingerprints. This country has got more people on their DNA and uh, fingerprint records than any other country in the world. Including children. Including children, yes, precisely. So this is, if you keep pushing more and more crimes, which really a lot of it's just absolute nonsense, as uh, no doubt you've discovered, then of course you're going to run more, expen more expenses. And it's like, you know, if you, if you have got to have the police spending time interviewing the Bishop of Chester, because he happens to refer to the biblical approach concerning homosexuality, as a criminal offence, well then the police haven't got the time to deal with what I call of real criminals involved in stealing and burglary and maybe uh, murder and other crimes. And of plus all the paperwork which is now forced upon them with all the targets. So what do they do? They look for the easy ones to deal with because that pushes up their target results, doesn't it? And so this is, this is all part of the pattern, but it's a deliberate process. 
by a few who know what they're doing. But unfortunately, they've got too many people involved. And even if you come to this whole question of political correctness, it's got the same philosophical background. The Frankfurt School of Communism is the origin of it many years ago. And so you can see that that source provides the philosophical base to lead on. And so now when we start to uh, have a look at this whole question of finance being the driving force and the ideological conversion being the basis by which people get hooked on this until they see the reality. And it's amazing how many people now who I remember as ardent Europhiles in the 1970s are now turn around and say to you, I was wrong. I got it wrong. We shouldn't be in. Um, don't, you admit, don't you find any? Well, do you find many people are still hotly in favour of the European Union? Most people just don't care either way. Well, I agree with you, there's a lot of that, but that's not, that's not new in history. No. History has always shown that the few, the few, will change the course of events, either for good or for evil, which of course means those who understand the principles that involve, and if you believe in the will to freedom, then the responsibility to do something about it is, I feel, very great. And so now let's have a look at this question of money. And of course we know from the scriptures that the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. So that in fact the whole question of materialism, which is philosophically fits into the will to power theme, because the power of business, the driving force to get bigger and bigger and bigger and take over everybody else and all the such like, is part of that same philosophical approach, rather than the smaller unit providing a good service uh, and uh, tradesmen surviving, uh, small firms surviving, producing good results. And of course, if, you, if they follow the correct approach, in my view, of stopping out of debt, never getting into the clutches of the banks, who, of course, if you go in for advice from the bank manager, I can assure you, you're just as likely to come out with a bank loan because that's their business, isn't it? They're providing it. But now let's have a look at money. How many people here have actually looked into the question of how all new money, I'm emphasizing the word new, how all new money is created and brought into existence? Have many people looked at this? No, one. Big pardon? Fractional reserve banking. Well, yes, you're, you're, you're on to it. That, that's the important point. And, and Harry over here. But it's most times when you start to talk about money, and I can remember it in the Federation of Small Businesses, because they that did actually adopt a report, which I, when I was chairman of a committee deal, of economic affairs dealing with this, which dealt with this issue. But most of them, if you start to mention this question of money and the creation of money, you can see a sort of glazed look come over their eyes. And, have you seen the cricket score lately? And, you know, the, the change of subject quickly. So, <laughs> their eyes are still open. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. What I want to tell you is that where we are now, where we are now is that 97% of all new money comes into existence through the banking system out of nothing. Out of nothing. It's created out of nothing. Like the Federal Reserve. Yes, but we want to get into the details. The Federal Reserve, this, is a, this, this, this basis of this is the same everywhere. And I want to, I should bring back why, it, why it's important, because what I'm leading up to is that this is the driving force behind many people, sometimes, most of the time innocently, to get bigger, to drive to to have a greater income, of course, but also to have something which is successful and bigger. Why they have to produce more next year to survive. Why they have to run faster, in fact, to be able to stop in the same place. And if you run a little bit faster than that, you might actually get ahead. That's, that's the driving thing, isn't it? Instead of being able to produce a good service, a constant service, no, that's, that's, that's financially, unless you're totally free of debt and accept a, a lower standard of, uh, of income, and don't worry about inflation, that is not on the cards. You can't do it. I mean, you know this from your own experience, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yes? A very simple question. The government prints the money, the time notes, the coins, and all the rest of it. So, how do you get wealth? 
All right, I'll, I'll cover your point. Yep, fine. Well, can, can I suggest pick up the questions after the break? But I'll deal with. I'm going to be dealing with this one, because in fact, the government is through the agency of the Bank of England, and the sub agencies of some other banks like in Ulster and Scotland and such like, but on license. And if we were part of the European Central Bank, it would be under license from the European Central Bank. Um, that's the, the next stage which they want to try and have us in. It's only 3% of the new money which comes into existence, which is actually the banknotes and coins. It's the petty cash of society. It's a very small amount. The profit on it goes, in fact, into the, uh, into the Treasury and helps to reduce taxation. But if you consider, you go back uh, 20, about 30 years, that 20% of the new money which came into existence was notes and coins. So that's the change. And it comes back to this fractional reserve system. And let me, uh, and that's, that, that's, that's one, of the, one of the keys, but it's not, not the total answer. A lot of people believe when you talk about new money coming into existence that the government does it all. It doesn't. And if you want to refer to something which is even more bizarre in many ways, in the United States of America, you've all perhaps heard of the Federal Reserve Bank, haven't you, in the United States? Well, how many people know that there are 13 Federal Reserve Banks in the United States of America? And they don't belong to the people. And they don't, no. They're privately owned. This was the trick when they put through the Federal Reserve Act in the United States, in the States of America in 1913. It's one of the interesting theories behind the assassination of President Kennedy, that he'd signed an executive order to try to start to deal with the question. Um, but, and same as the other one concerning... Uh, can you make a note of the question? Yeah, sure. that, 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 so that I can keep to, keep to the time. I'm running a little over it as, as it is. Um, but the, it, it's an important point to pick up. Now, the fact that it's privately owned is, is another matter. It's like the Bank of England was privately owned and, until 1946, and the fact that it's been nationalised hasn't made any difference. In fact, it's gone the other way. And as I said, it's gone from 20% the, the, through the Bank of England, the notes and coins being created, down to 3%. So the, the, you know, the Bank of England is almost redundant now. It just does a certain amount of regulatory work on other banks. And the, the government has been, in various ways, and that's a story in itself, has been challenged on this question of the banks creating the money out of nothing. And in the process of creating it out of nothing, it's created it as a debt. A debt for society. A debt for individuals. A debt for businesses. A debt for government at whatever level. And how do you get out of debt in this process? Very simple. Well, that's one way, yes. Uh, for those who didn't see, he had a shotgun up to his head. <laughs> no, the best way to get out, as far as the, uh, the economist is concerned, is to borrow more the next time. So you can pay off your debt and have some left over. Well, you know, that's enough to lead the person to the shotgun that sh our friend here has just referred to. And so you've got to have a look at how, how it's done and what is the attitude to this in government. No, the banker, whilst I told that story about the small businessman at the, at the beginning, the banker is in fact under tremendous pressure himself. And I've had discussions with senior bank executives on this particular point, and I approached it and I said, you know, one of the reasons I think, you know, a number of officials, not necessarily at director level, because I've had some of interesting discussions with, at director level, but, you know, the ordinary bank employee is under more and more pressure because they keep on reducing staff, they expect them to go faster and, and, and be more productive than ever before. And the reason is the same driving financial driving force. And in fact, it could be relieved if we looked at this question. And I've got bank managers on side on this issue. The ones who you have slightly more difficulty with is, in fact, the directors. And I hope you'll pardon me, Mr. Chairman, if I just mention an interesting little story uh, which I've done, tried on one or two bank directors, usually at dinner functions, where the bank's paying for the dinner. Uh, this is when, when I was looking after policy issues with the Federation of Small Businesses. And I'd say to the, uh, to the bank director, I said, could I ask you a moral and philosophical question? And they'd say, well, go on, Don, what is it? 
Well, before I come to the question, can I just clear one or two points? First of all, would you mind telling me what is your current liquidity ratio? And it, sometimes they discuss a little bit to find out what you mean by that. But quite often they come back and they say, well, it's about 12.5%. So I say, what you're saying then is that you're lending about eight times the amount of money you've actually got. And he said, well, yes, I suppose if you put it that way, that's right, yes, that's right. I said, fine, so you're lending the money against that reserve base, which those who've talked about the fractional reserve system, is, is, this is what we're talking about here. You're lending the money and you're, you're bringing that into existence out of nothing against that base. And he said, yes, that's right, that's what we do. I said, okay, so if you're bringing the money into existence against that base, let's say for the sake of the discussion, out of nothing, you're doing that against the capacity of the community to produce goods and services. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right, that's what we do. I said, well, if you're, if you're actually bringing the money into existence out of nothing against the capacity of the community to produce goods and services, surely you're effectively claiming ownership to that capacity. Well, the discussion takes a little longer at this stage because he starts to see where you're heading. <laughs> and um, he's, he's, I usually find that, yes, they, they do concede. Yes, that, that's, that, I suppose that's the way the thing works. You know, they'd be very, quite philosophical about it. Yes, that's, that's the way the system works, they say. I said, OK, well, that's fine. I said, now can I come to my moral and philosophical question? You've agreed you create the money out of nothing on a formula. You agree that this is against the capacity of the community to produce goods and, uh, goods and services and that thereby you're effectively claiming ownership to that capacity. My moral and philosophical question is, do you have the moral right to claim that ownership? <laughs> oh, then they go around the houses. At that stage, well, they say, well, of course, that's why we do so much um, sponsorship work and uh, community work and um, well you've seen them they've sponsored look at the number of things they've sponsored they tell you they go through all the marvelous things they do but this is you know this is from bank directors I've had you know I'm, I'm not doing feeling with theory I've actually sat down at a dinner table when they've had more wine than I've had because I like to try and keep keep a clear head on this one and it, it you know this is what they admit but now then let's come to the point on this one because for many, many years, it would be totally denied by bankers, and many bankers, particularly those who haven't done their banking exams because they've done some other marketing exams or something, used to, not admit, used to deny that this was the process that the bank went through. That's, that's a thing of the past. Then the next stage was that the Treasury, the government, used to deny. No, 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 that didn't happen. That, wasn't, that didn't happen. But there were, there were people in the House of Lords um, I can't remember the particular Lord at the moment, it slips my mind, it, it, but it's been raised in the House of Lords and it's been raised through members of Parliament writing to the Treasury. And they now admit that this is done, this is the process. But they say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, they say, provided, provided it's manageable and provided there's confidence in the banking system and providing it's well regulated. Now that's the stage. In other words, the argument has moved on a bit over the years. So, you know, there's, there, there, there is movement and there, there is hope in dealing with this. But you see, the essence of what we're dealing with is that if you examine industry, when industry produce, produces goods and services, through the, the, through the dividends and through the wages system, there isn't sufficient purchasing power which is distributed to be able to buy the goods and, all the goods and services. So and this is why you get a number of cutthroat things. This is why you get the progressive centralization that I've referred to earlier. This is why you get the other argument where you must export or perish. You've heard these arguments in the past. You must export more than you import. Well, we do it the other way around, don't we? Um, and that's why, I mean, this, what happens and what's the results of that? Well, we could deal with that at question time. But the essence of what we're dealing with here, as far as the purchasing power is concerned, is that there is a shortage of purchasing power because 
in the banking process, when that money is created out of nothing, they earn interest on it. And we've got to find the interest. But the only way the more money is going to be created is through the same system again. It's mathematically impossible. And that's why you get the growth, and you've seen the headlines in the paper, the growth of personal debt, business debt, government debt. Every, time, every now and then it goes down a little bit. And if you manage to export more than the, you import, of course, then you give the problem to somebody else. And said of yourself that this is why the Germans had a lovely time for a long time, because they, that they exported their problems to everybody else when they had all their huge surpluses. Why China having a, doing reasonably well now on this basis? Because their surpluses are huge, huge. The Japanese and the Koreans doing the same. And there's, you know, there's lots of other questions which you can link into this, but this is the underlying issue. This is the driving force why we had to have a common market, why we were persuaded in this country and the people, all right, only about 42% voted, and a majority of that 42% who voted yes, did it on the basis that they want, believed that the common market would be good for the economy and we'd all be better off afterwards. Well, we know the answer, don't we? But the driving force, and this is where it's the philosophical driving force, is finance, together with the philosophical centralization of power. That's the important points that you've got to understand. So, the answers, the decentralization of power, more localism, more local control, less at, at, at uh, Westminster level, take it away, of course, totally from Brussels, but even if we take it away from Brussels, it's important that we decentralize and have more effective local government in this country, rather than everything being run from Westminster. Westminster doesn't know best on everything. Civil servants aren't best in running business or running the National Health Service, as we know, and as we were discussing over lunch a little bit. This is the reality, and you can go into those issues. So those are the, that's the picture. And how can we do it? Well, I'll just send a couple of minutes just saying quite simply that if you actually establish what, for want of a better word, I'll call a national credit authority, which in fact brought new money into existence rather than through the banking system, the banking system is a very effective, and the British banking system generally a fairly efficient bookkeeping system. They don't need to be nationalized, and the bankers don't need to be shot. They just need to provide a good service without having that ownership effectively of, of the means of production. If we had this national credit authority, it could look at how the economy is working and the potential and there is no reason out of money cre created through that National Credit Authority that every man, woman and child in the country, perhaps we want to establish that they'd had residence here for at least 10 years, could have a monthly dividend, which could be a national dividend, because anybody running a company, they have shares, and we're shareholders in Britain, Great United Kingdom Unlimited, aren't we? That's the reality. To deal with inflation, there's another element you, which you need to deal with, apart from the reduction of, uh, of taxation and particularly VAT, you could have a form of reverse VAT instead of adding 17.5% on to uh, goods and services where you have to pay VAT, you could take, shall we say, 5% off, 10% off, according to how the economic system is working. In other words, that's a technical question, and I'd only discuss it with somebody who understands accounting and particularly double-entry bookkeeping. But that's quite possible to do it. There is an answer, but as I said, we need to look at that financial question, we need to look at the will to freedom, and, and we need to look at decentralization of power. And just to show you that I do believe that that banker shouldn't have been shot, and it was unfortunate for that small businessman that he had to come back and say he loved to hear them say that the, the bank manager had died, but you know, the deputy manager did make sure that that small businessman was invited to, a to the funeral. And at the committal in the churchyard, the small businessman was standing next to the bank, assistant bank manager, and he looked into the grave, and he quietly said to the assistant manager, I've never seen a grave so deep. He said, this is a huge grave, and it's such a long way down. And the assistant manager said to him, just very quietly, he said, well, don't you know, he said, deep down, bank managers are quite nice. <laughs> right. The 
question I would like to ask is, regarding banking, you mentioned earlier that the system of creating money out of nothing and then charging interest on it was one which we're all belaboured under at the moment. But how would you suggest that we could do this without it being, as it is at the moment, a, um, a, f a power on all of us to uh, pay interest? Surely there must be a way that where the banks could uh, loan money without it being generated from nothing in the first place. I mean, if a man's got a, a lot of money to lend, he must make interest on that money in order to be able to operate. Right. <laughs> well, let's take this. It's a, it's a very broad question and a very wide one. Uh, for a number of years, I was chairing an organization known as the Forum for Stable Currencies. We used to meet first uh, with the uh, host being Lord Sudley and then with Lord Ahmed in the House of Lords. And on the table there, I think my wife might have a look to see where it is if you haven't found it, there is the briefing notes for an early day motion. Yes, my wife's got it. It's a fairly, it's a, she's holding it up so you can see what its size it is. Now these are briefing notes dealing with this question of the bank create, banks creating money and how you stop it, which is a, essentially what you're, you're asking about. First of all, you have to face the reality that when you put your money in the bank, you're not giving them that money to start with. And secondly, if they lend money, they don't take it out of your account. So this is you know, part of what's tied up with the, the creating out of nothing. So the first point you need to look at is any money deposited with a bank, unless under term, a longer term, which they then have the right to use it, because you don't have the right to use it, to lend, then they, can do, they could do so. Any other on-demand money which you have should, like solicitors or accountants, be in a client's account. And for the banks, off balance sheet. So they wouldn't have the right to use that money to create money out of nothing, which is what they rely on. So that, in effect, what happens with your current accounts at the moment, you've got as we discussed before, the great deception. They offer you free banking because they don't need to charge because they're doing very well nicely out of the what is philosophically fraudulent. I like to sometimes say that in fact it's a, an historic fraud which has been legalized. And if you go into the history of it, that, that in my view is the facts. But what you then have to face with this great deception of free banking is that you would have to pay for them to run your account. But if you weren't constantly under economic pressure and huge debt, in other words, if you start to reverse that process, you wouldn't mind paying the banks for, for running your account because it's a very efficient bookkeeping system. Like you pay your accountant to do your accounts, you'd be paying the bank. But if you've dealt with the other financial questions at the same time, then, then there's no difficulties. And indeed, let's put it this way, I can remember saying to a banker on one occasion because of um, one of the ways they make a profit is on international exchange. As you know, when you buy the currency, you're charged one rate, and when you sell it back to them, you're charged a lower, it's, it's a different rate. And they make money on the difference as well as the commission. Sometimes they don't charge a commission, but sometimes it's more on the differential rates. So there's various ways of doing it. So I said to the banker on one occasion, I said, could you live with the situation that you had, in fact, to have only one official interest um, rate of exchange, and that that rate of exchange was based upon the purchasing power of the cur currency in the country concerned? In other words, then you had a, a, a direct relationship, and it would have to be perhaps fixed on a monthly basis, so you followed reality, the important point in the countries. And the banker's answer was very simple. He said, yes, we could live with that without any, any difficulty at all. We just have to put other charges up. And it's, that's perfectly correct. They're running a business. They're running a business which is providing a service. 
And one of the major services that they're running, which is personal current accounts, is run for nothing. Now, if you were running a business, could you offer your customers services and not charge them? You couldn't do it, could you? So, therefore, there would have to be a charge. But you then, as I said, the important point is that you would then be in a financial position if they followed through the other things, that you are not under the economic stress and paying the, a, a normal account for run, a normal bill for running the account would be no problem because they're an efficient bookkeeping service. The only way you could run it on that similar fashion without charging for services is by putting up the you're well, selling. Yes. Yeah, well, there's various ways they can get round it. Yeah. Could I just make a few points here? Um, I, I read economics at university a, a long time ago, and I've forgotten most of it, so please excuse if I make any errors which you don't think I should make. I also ran a financial services business for 30-odd years um, until we were stopped when we ran into a set of British Rail buffers uh, in the form of corruption in the British legal system, which is one of the reasons for my interest in these subjects. Um, talking about banks, uh, we, we, we come in on several planes. One plane is the outright skullduggery and charlatanism that we see among banks these days. Uh, and there is the connection of that between the economic policy or lack of policy of our current government. Um, then there is the question of the roots of the banking system, which is where we came in on fractional banking. Uh, there's then, finally, the question of our main concern is espionage, and collectivist aims being pursued by a minority who are trying to wreck Western Europe. I think we need to be careful not to get too bogged down in the other aspects relating to banking in relation to the espionage threat to Britain and some other Western nations, probably not to the same extent as we're subject to. Just talking quickly on the charlatanism of banks. We have a system where executives are remunerated these days by, uh, there's been a revolution in contracts for directors, executive and non-executive, over the last few years. Uh, so say, to bring us on a, a competitive plane with the rest of the advanced world, so that Executives in America should, for instance, find it just as attractive to come and work in this country. They've then been put on contracts which are linked to bonuses, uh, linked often to short-term performance. Uh, they therefore, uh, the, uh, and with regard to putting money in their back pocket, they go unscrupulously for whatever performance, short-term performance they can get with their organization to boost profit figures, which in turn comes immediately in bonuses in their back pocket. And we all know the levels of bonuses. Um, that is also shored up by a lack of uh, transparency to shareholders. So they're able to get away with it without shareholders often knowing about it or particularly being able to do anything about it, although that is gradually changing. So, we have a situation where the banks have changed out of all recognition over five or six years, where there is this gross stampede for profit at expense of everything else. They're not worried about the medium-term reputation of the organization. Um, some organizations are speaking up about this, but not enough. Uh, and the Labour government have let a lot of this go through because um, they've cozied up to loads of firms and one of the motivations we know is to get loans from them to fund the Labour Party. So they've kept quiet and said nothing. 
or quietly encourage them. And the amount of dirty washing which is yet to be wrung out on this subject may be small in relation to what we hear, especially when the main circus stroke ringmaster um, withdraws from his twice daily appearance on our television screens in 10 days time. Um, question? Yep. <laughs> Not quite, but if there's a question, do you want to ask? Uh, well, it, it, it's this, the whole gunning at banks and so on. It's very important we realize why they are behaving as they are. As far as the um, fractional banking system, uh, we shouldn't forget that it was that which enabled the Industrial Revolution and industrialization. If it hadn't been for the ability to lend money on the basis of confidence and the backing of certain assets, the pace of industrialization would have been a lot slower. Okay, I've said a lot there, but uh, I hope I haven't said too much, but I hope some of them were worthwhile. Well, may, may I start off by saying I'm pleased to hear that you've forgotten most of what you learned um, <laughs> when you studied economics, um, because I think that means you're now looking at reality, whereas previously a lot of economic theories, of course, produced the opposite. Um, in, in, in fact, of course, I think it was, wasn't it George Bernard Shaw who once said that if you put all the economists end to end, you'd never reach a conclusion. Um, <laughs> and the other, the other thing, which, pardon the digression, which I remember of George Bernard Shaw is when he was talking to a colleague about a lot of his plans for the future uh, centralized state, um, what he saw as a, a socialism in those days, his f business friend said to him, my goodness, he said, these, these revolutionary plans you have, he said, what will all those businessmen in Rotary be doing? Well, he said, it's very simple, they'll be going to lunch. <laughs> um, which, of course, is back to the problem we were talking about earlier uh, on the question of apathy. But you open a, a huge area, it, uh, particularly, let's pick out the point of the profits, executive salaries, and the contracts, and the short-termism. Yes, there's a lot of that uh, uh, on the go at the moment. And in a number of areas, of course, it's producing total false situations. Uh, I spoke about it with respect to the police, of course. Um, we've seen it particularly with respect to uh, hospitals as well, haven't they? They do all sorts of peculiar things because their eyes are purely on fulfilling the target. In other words, it completely skews things. In other words, it gets away from reality. Yes, you've got to deal with that. But one of the things that these, the, the bankers, the very senior, usually the chief executives or the chairman, whatever it is, in, in particular cases, get these huge figures, is because they still have the ability to use this money created out of nothing. What, if you removed that, uh, that stage, then in fact things would have to be looked at far more realistically. For instance, let's look a lot of, and it's interesting that even the government's getting slightly concerned now, a lot of these uh, private equity takeovers, the only reason they've been able to go ahead is because they've had backing from banks who are using money created out of nothing so that they can then take over, asset strip, um, uh, take out various parts, make them profitable and sell them on, all sorts of arrangements. So therefore, I come back to the point, if you deal with the central issue on that, that's not, that takes out one important run. But at the same time, you've got a very large moral and philosophical question at work, haven't you? And this is the question of those who see the love of money as their sole purpose of existence. Now that's a philosophical point. You can't deal with that in terms of economics. It's, they, 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 these, in fact, it's, in my view, it's become totally immoral. But you don't pull them down, as the, is the answer. That's not the answer, in my view. You help to pull other people up. And therefore, if you tack it from, tackle it from the other end, for instance, if you're dealing with some of the economic problems which we were talking about, and you've got this National Credit Authority to which I refer, 
then you'd have more people with actual savings who would want to consider investing in various businesses and people like yourself who have in financial services, although I agree with the difficulties they're in that field now, of course, have become greater. But if they were then able to have groups of people investing in businesses which were viable and you didn't have these pressures because of the debt, then you start to look at, at things from a different point of view. People would use their savings effectively, particularly if they had a national dividend paid into their account once a month. They wouldn't be under the pressures to do all the things which they, quite often, down under, they feel, I shouldn't be doing this, but I've got no alternative. Provide them with an alternative. Yeah, you, you get the skullduggery with the loans and the such like, yes, but let's deal with that as an issue on its own. That doesn't become a reason for which will often be used by the centralizers to introduce taxation on a graduated scale whilst leaving a few loopholes for those who understand where they can put their money offshore or somewhere else. Um, so that you, if I say, do it from the grassroots up. That's how I would um, approach your one. The, uh, the skullduggery of the banks, I don't know what you were referring to on skullduggery for the banks because whilst they've got into the situation of having the historical fraud legalized and the government says it doesn't matter which is what they've their what their line is at the moment um, then they're doing what they're entitled to do and what they've been allowed to get away from get, get away with and i think therefore the actual skullduggery by banks is very, I would say, very limited. Is what? Very limited. Well, I, it's your meeting, and uh, the last thing I want to do is um, interject very much. I mean, I know of cases, uh, let, let's, let's deal with that. Well, I'm not moving away very limited. I know of plenty of cases where there have been, has been skullduggery by bank managers. I know I can, because I've, I've been involved with businessmen trying to deal with this. Um, and I know when they've, they, they've made an utter hash of things, and a number of them has, have been, yes, skullduggery, a number of them have been total inefficiency. I can think of one particular case, the gentleman concerns just died. He went to the bank for a, uh, for a loan, short-term loan, to deal with a particular export order. Uh, all the details were in the hands of the bank manager and his competitor then got the contract and the only way he could have got the details to be able to do it was through that bank manager. Um, now there are cases of those but if you, the reason I'm still saying their skullduggery is limited, that is not the majority position and what, for instance, there was another safe, wasn't it, struggle against financial exploitation or something. I can't remember if I got it right. And they were particularly going for Barclays. But again, the number of, they, there are a number of these cases, but they are not the majority situation and they should be dealt with more effectively on a case by case basis. by individual bank managers, uh, really. Uh, now, yes, that, uh, that is a phenomenon, but um, it may not be any more pronounced than skullduggery in any um, commercial sphere. Well, the skullduggery I'm talking about by banks uh, would cover macro uh, phenomena covering the whole country, such as there was a lot of publicity two or three years ago and it may still be going on, whereby banks were, in, or bank employees were encouraging people uh, who clearly were not able to cover the cost of loans, they were encouraging them to borrow. That got a lot of publicity, and, and, and a lot of people who were seriously ill were drawn into it, and there were a lot of suicides as a result of the uh, debt problems they got themselves into. Another thing, and that's under investigation now, the results of that have yet to come out, is the selling of insurance policies against loans, against redundancy, sickness, etc., etc. The premiums are sky high, about 20 times as high as they need to be. 
Uh, and the, the banks have made profits of about five billion a year on that alone. Now this is under scrutiny. That was centralized conspiracy by the top bankers. Um, final point is this business of bank charges. You go over your overdraft limit, you have a charge of 35 quid a day, every day, compounding, etc. Uh, the, it's been proven that the, the charge should be related to the actual cost of the bank and 35, it, it should be 5 quid. The bank are paying out, a friend of mine phoned me yesterday, he had just had two payments, one of five, one of 6,000 pounds from two banks uh, on this business of overcharging. They're paying out before it gets to court. So those are three examples where this is macro, countrywide fraud. Not your average bank manager uh, jiggling a deal, and, and that can have as much to do with the individual bank manager, or maybe social organizations that he's a member of, and I, I won't go into anything on that. Yeah. The, the, the point you bring out here, of course, all of this rests totally on the basis that the only way society can keep on going is by borrowing more the next time. And that the bank's main ba basis of business is actually trying to get, they, they, because of the multiplier fact in, in the reserve system that operates, they've got a huge surplus of funds by this mechanism which they want to lend to make the profit. And that, that's, that's why they're that's why they're concentrating on that. That's why they're, I mean, and we're still getting it. It's not just the advertisements in the paper. Every week I'm getting, I personally am getting applications to apply for loans and transfer loans. We're all, you know, everybody is getting it. The fact, and the other one you've brought out is, but again, I say, this rests on the, uh, on the fractional reserve operation. That, that's what it rests. The overcharging for, this has been going on for a long time. Um, and in fact, I took a case uh, uh, where I made the accusation concerning fraudulent overcharging to the Competition Commission in my evidence, which I gave to the Competition Commission. And I, del I was deliberately provocative when I did that. And one of the members on the panel, I can't remember who it was now, um, turned around and said to me, that's a very serious allegation. I said, yes, it is a very serious allegation. and I wouldn't have made it if I didn't have the evidence. I said, I have it on a video here. Would you accept the video as evidence? And of course, they couldn't do anything else other than take the evidence. And yes, there are various mechanisms which they can use as well as exploitation. But it's based, because you've got one major fraud in the middle of it, it expands out. And if you're meeting the skullduggery on that, yes, I think there's, that there are measures, well, the, the, the uh, Office of Fair Trading has come back on this, this latest one, haven't they? So yes, um, the overchargings and the, the, the such like. Uh, and it's so complicated quite often that the people, ordinary people can't work it out. You have to have a special program to do it or accountancy background. So that yes, there is that. But again, I do want to emphasize, if you didn't have the fraudulent base, they wouldn't be in that same field exploiting it. Well, <laughs> there, yes, the Bank of England is meant to be monitoring it. Um, their, their job is to so regulate things that people don't lose confidence in the banking system. This is, this is the essence of it, as I know from my own discussions with Eddie George, because I've been to many meetings in the Bank of England de dealing basically with small business issues. And I can assure you, I got some very interesting answers, particularly when we had round the day, but table, um, senior bankers, government officials, as well as Bank of England officials, a and some academics. Um, so that, yes, that's the essence. There's still confidence in the banking system and relegation. And, and, but they don't actually challenge the underlying point of the bank's lending on the basis that they do. That is not challenged. Look at that one, it, it, and it is an important one, 
And there was another point which was just went yes, through my mind, I, but it's still. come in here? You better go to another question. Um, no, no, there was, was one point you did raise about the British Empire being built on this system. Well, of course, the tally stick system, the Treasury doing the tally stick, you know, goes back to Henry I, oh, went yes. on until 1826. So this idea that we, you know, we, we went back from the foundation of the Bank of England is complete nonsense. We still had the tallistic system, uh, and that is how we issued our money out of nothing from, or, by the Treasury. Uh, that I didn't know about until quite recently, so I think that's a correction that you've got to look at. 1826, now if you study your economics since 1826, you then will see the distortions coming in, I'm quite sure. You know. yeah. uh, but, but again, the point you've got to get at is, if you, in fact you bring up, you increase the independence, the economic independence of ordinary individuals, and ordinary individuals' ability to then invest in, in business activities, and you can get away from the banks being the controlling force, then you start to bring, you start to spread the power. That's the point. The power of control of your own affairs is spread. At the moment, you know, if you're an individual shareholder in these huge multinational corporations, you might get a dividend from time to time, but you can't, you can't have any influence on anything. You're the one but I, I better stop you, just in case there's somebody else okay, first. Yes, that's, that's one of the essences of it. Um, yes. Yes. Um, coming from a, um, an evangelical standpoint, um, the, the, in the Bible it says you shall not lend your money on usury. Um, the thing is, I, perhaps I haven't been sufficient of a Bible scholar. I haven't really worked out what the alternative is. But um, once looking at a number of things which are, um, if you go back to the 1980s and, and 90s, um, are you familiar with, with, with a, um, a New Zealand evangelist by the name of Barry Smith? Yes. And uh, he, he travelled the world um, preaching and telling people about the coming uh, One World Government and the New World Order and everything like that. And one of the things he used to talk about quite a lot was the, uh, the, the attempt by um, the, uh, um, was the, the, the banking uh, uh, fraternity to bring about a cashless society, which still hasn't happened yet. That seems to be receding a bit, um, it, for, for, from the sort of perceptions, uh, at least. I mean, it may still be there, but uh, I, I, I just wanted to ask you about that. And what, one or two other things, um, commenting on the, the previous um, uh, questioner, um, I, from my own personal point of view, I, I, I suffered under monetarism in the uh, um, um, 80s and 90s. And, and in fact, I, I had a business which was turning over a lot of money, but. Uh, um, because we'd been, my wife and I had been encouraged to borrow by the banks and not really sort of in, uh, getting any good advice about paying back, we, we let the overdraft run up and up and up. So when the high interest rates came in, it rather wiped out the profits of the business and the business had to close. So, 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 so that's a consequence of mon monetarism. It always struck me that these, these sort of high interest rates of sort of up around 15% were criminal because a business struggles to make 15%. Because of the ERM, wasn't yes, it? yes, that, that was under the ERM. But the banks. oh, absolutely, yes, absolutely. But the the uh, the, the other point I, I wanted to ask you: um, Are you familiar with um, the, the writings of uh, Christopher Story? He's been covering a lot on Leo Wanter and um, this uh, um, recapitalization of the American economy and so forth, which seems to be um, um, which we say there seems to be a battle going on there. I wonder if you'd be able to comment on that as well. To cover that lot in detail, you'd probably need another hour. Yes. Um, but let, let's go back to the evangelical point of view. I mean, historically, the, um, the paying of interest was a no-no in Christianity, the same, as, in, uh, um, the same as, in, as far as the Muslims are concerned, who take the same attitude. Um, but I can remember saying to some Muslim friends, tell me which Muslim country does not create money out of nothing through the banking system. And they say, well, we have to admit there isn't one. Um, so they do rely on, particularly, of course, in the Middle East, their oil reserves to be able to, well, buy up, um, and it comes back to your Christopher Story question because of this oil question. Uh, they're using their situation there 
to buy up assets in the States and, and elsewhere. So yes, I, I mean, the answer of not borrowing and not charging interest, um, it's Deuteronomy, isn't it, if I remember correctly, which talks uh, on the question of not lending interest. And I've had some interesting discussions on this one because a number of people turn around and say, yes, that was only between Jews, the Scriptures. <laughs> The scriptures actually you, you, they, they actually do that. No, you, no, no, no. You're, you're quite right. Yes. Hebrews, Hebrews. Yes. yes, no, quite right. But um, this is where I perhaps looked at the wrong translation because some of the wording has been changed on some occasions, yes. as you know. Um, no, you're quite right. And this, this is the difference. But historically, the church used to say interest was a, was a no-no. And that, that's a big problem. But I, I think... One of the things you look at, and your, your tale about the interest rates going up, of course, there's an awful lot of businesses being involved in that. I think there needs to be a look, and I, this is me talking personally, at putting greater responsibility on lenders. Mm. Yes. Um, and one of the ways to pull banks up, to be quite frank, is that if, a, if money is lent from the fractional reserve system, then the recovery of the debt should be unenforceable. Um, they'd, they'd be a lot more cautious in their lending. Yes. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the, one of the things which the, some of the Islamic banks are looking at, which will produce some interesting pressures, is not lending on interest now, but in fact taking, uh, taking um, a shareholding which can be purchased back in a business. So that's the way they introduce the, 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 the capital from the bank. And if the business makes a loss, then the bank on its shareholding yes. takes a loss. And if they make a profit, then they take a share of the profit. Uh, and that, is, that, is, that to me is a far more honest approach uh, to looking at it. Particularly if they're taking money out, creating money out of nothing. Yes. Well, yes, particularly if they're following that system at the moment, but it could still be done even if they weren't doing that. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't change the principle. You're one on the cashless society. Uh, yes, I remember Barry Smith on this one. In fact, we. Uh, I, I, we used to carry his books, but of course he's died since, as you know, um, and I don't think, know that we've got, um, well, I think we've only got one or two left of his now. Um, yes, I think in some of, I agree with what most of what Barry Smith had to say, uh, having been to a couple of his meetings, but sometimes I think he was a little bit too dramatic with it. Yes. Um, but having said that, the cashless society has not gone away, um, the, there are supposedly, and I can't remember where, because I've read the reports, I think it's, yes, it would be this year, on introducing a, a form of credit card, which is cash, which you go to the bank and top it up, as the first stage of it. Now, this is the sort of instrument it's that Barry like Smith Mondex. was... Big pardon? A bit like Mondex. A bit like Mondex, yes, which, of course, this is, this is a different approach, which they tried in, in Swindon and they tried it in, um, in Slough as well. And, and it, it didn't take on. The problem there is slightly the cost because all the retailers have got to have the machines to be able to operate the system and so they're not terribly keen. Um, so you, you've got... Big pardon? The emissions are slow. It's to use dealing cash anyway. Well, that's right. And, and, and frankly, the more we, do, we, the more we deal in, in cash, the better because then at least you, you know that helps to increase the, the money supply, not... Uh, the bank's getting advantage, but the taxpayer getting the advantage on the, the, the sovereignty involved. Now, the, the wanter and the um, Secretary of Commerce, isn't it, Paulson in the States, the Christopher Story one. Um, I don't know. I'm following this. I, I, I haven't read it up for a couple of months now um, because one or two things which are supposed to have happened in the fall and, and the arresting and the such like of Secretary Paulson hasn't happened. Um, and I don't know what the next stage is on that one, so I'm, I've got an open mind on that one. Do, do you think that some good will come out of it in the end? No, I, 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 can't, I can't see it necessarily producing any good in itself because what they're looking at there is, is criminal activity, yeah. basically. Yeah. That's what he's saying, and therefore they'll... 
yes, that, that's the, as Christopher's story puts it. And therefore, if they're going to deal with a criminal activity and, a criminal, and, and want to prosecute him and put it behind bars, that doesn't deal with the underlying issues um, which are involved. And therefore, um, I don't know that it's going to be of much value, except that it's a damned interesting story. Yes, I mean, there's, there's was it uh, 4.3 billion trillion dollars? Oh, it's a huge sums, huge sums. And, and, and then running up, running up to about, something like up to about 70 trillion, I think. Oh, yes, yes. He it's also claims that they've stolen the Queen's gold. Yes. Yes, yes. yeah. Well, I... I it's worth so many million or trillion. Yes. I, I, I'm cautious on what that one. What are they doing with the Queen's gold at that time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know. I, she, she didn't tell me last time I had tea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, could I ask you, do you think about the EU, because it's a matter that has some interest to me? Um, we have a number of organizations. Um, I dare say there may be meetings around the country, uh, not unlike this one. Uh, but there's the CIB, there's the democracy movement, there's the freedom of association. You might almost include the BNF. Uh, as individual organisations, their impact on the political system of the major parties that who are going to make our legislation and who ultimately will probably decide whether we're so deeply into the EU, EU that we can't get out, uh, is minimal. If we were to join together as a united anti-EU front, then the political parties of the day might have to listen to them because it would be apparent to them that the, not to do so would do to their own considerable disadvantage. I should be interested to have your view on the subject. The, the attraction of having one large anti-EU body is very seductive. It's very, very, very seductive. It's the centralization of the activities in one group with one executive. And it would, in my opinion, be an absolute disaster. Because they have one target only, the opposition, and they could undermine that, pick out the, get, get the head of one on the scandals and something else, and they'd have a disastrous effect. Therefore, big pardon? Ah, there is an alliance. Well, there isn't. That's the trouble. There is. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a member of it. What? Well, I mean, there's lots so, of different groups and none of them do anything together. Uh, well, in our part of the world, the number of the things do it up, and quite often a lot of people are members of more than one, so that helps with it. But let me, let, let's, let's follow this one through, because I think it, this, this is a, a very important and fundamental question. And in fact, th th this, to me, the, the, uh, the attraction of getting into one shows the extent to which the centralized collectivist philosophy is actually out into the community as the only way of dealing with it. It's not. A multiplicity of organizations working together, working together, and I do agree that they could be made far more effective. There is an alliance. It used to be called the Anti-Maastricht Alliance. That's where it first came into existence, but it's somewhat broader than that. Um, it's now called the Alliance Against the EU Constitution. And it, at the moment, it's sitting waiting to see what's going to happen with Mr. Blair at the end of this month, when he, whether or not he, he concedes more, more in it. But you, the, the different organisations, I can't remember them all, but I'll name, name some of them are involved with the Alliance. There's UKIP, which is one which has been referred to. There's the Campaign for an Independent Britain, and in fact, the chairman of that until uh, now, he's just stepped down. Lord Stoddard was chairman of the Alliance. He's stepped down from the chairmanship of the Alliance uh, and Sir Teddy Taylor has just taken over um, to try and... Another body is um, what used to be known as the anti common Market League, now called the Get Britain Out. Uh, they are part of the Alliance. The Federation of Small Businesses is part of the Alliance. That's a difficult one because in fact, there's been a tremendous campaign for a very small minority within the Federation and without trying to undermine the Federation's policy on this issue. And I know I've been the centre of the target of it. 
In fact, a friend in security told me that one of the reasons they targeted me was because of my position with respect to the EU and they wanted to get me out of the scene. Um, but in fact, I'd fortunately got enough other colleagues that I've worked with in there that they've managed to maintain the policy and they've tried to upset it many times. Uh, I did serve on the Chancellor's um, in this position on the Chancellor's Business Advisory Group and I could tell you some interesting stories on, on that but I better not digress. Other members of the Alliance, the British Housewives League was another one. Um, say, don't announce it. Beg your pardon? They don't announce it. They do. They, 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 they don't stand up and, and all say we are uh, an that, alliance, come and join us. Ah, that, no, they, they, they don't say come and join the Alliance but they do get, try to increase their membership of their own. Yes, the democracy movement, they are a number, another member on that one. But here you're up against an interesting aspect of the media. And here a lot of work has been done on the media to try and get the media to give the sort of publicity that you're referring to because how else can they get it out other than to their individual membership? It's through the media. And it's almost as if there's a a D notice on the media to say you don't give publicity to this. Now, now therefore the working together is important and so I can say certainly in my part of the world there is a there is a there are around the country various mini alliances which are the local groups working on a local basis doing it together and I know that um, in in East Anglia there have been a number of activities where we've well in my own constituency of South Suffolk, which was referred to, there was a lot of very good um, campaign for an independent Britain um, leaflets, which you UKIP put out in that area in support. Can I ask you a question? Yes. If this alliance has got so many factions in it, yeah. not as one whole, but as a lot of small, you agree. why haven't they, the alliance with all their factions, got together some sort of demonstration of protest against what Blair is going to do next week because we all know that he's going to do it. We all know that it's a constitution by another name. He promised us a referendum. If all these... Oh, I don't think anyone needs it with my big mouth. <laughs> if all these um, different people, different groups, were en masse on a particular day to converge on London and say, you know, we're not going to have it. You promised us a referendum and we want it. We might have been able to do some good. But when you've got 20 in one group and 40 in another and 100 in another, it's, it's just a waste of time doing anything. No. Well, let, 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 let's, let, let's, <laughs> well. Would you want to look after it? No, well, no, I wouldn't, thank you very much. I couldn't stand the grin to start no, with. Um, but um, let, let's, the, the, the frustration on this, I understand. Um, they aren't necessarily small numbers involved in the different organisations where you say 20 and this and the such like. There are some with small numbers, but I just take the Federation of Small Businesses as a start. There's over 200,000 there. Um, but... The question of mobilising them in one big demonstration, the issue has to be hot enough to be able to get people to come out. No, no, there's the few dedicated, there's a few times we've had demonstrations when there's been tried, we've picked the right times to do it. Because no doubt, like myself, you've been on some of these in the past. But you have to... this business with Blair is the right time. No, it's not the right time at the moment because the issue has been raised in the Commons. The issue has been raised in the Lords. The media has, some media has gone, given some publicity to it. So, in fact, the pressure which has been coming, and from the different organisations who've written in on these, and the individual members of Alden. In fact, the best letters are from the individual <laughs> members, yeah. writing into the MPs, writing to the MP to get him to ask the Prime Minister, because then more people have to read the letter on the way. Uh, and, of course, it's the correct way, because the Prime Minister has to reply to a Member of Parliament, whereas he doesn't have to reply to you. Uh, the Member of Parliament doesn't have to reply to you, and most times they do Well, then, 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 we could, then you're on to a different issue, and the tactics on how to deal with that I'm quite happy to discuss with you, but that's, that's another one on its, uh, on its own. Surely the real answer is that uh, this has happened. The Countryside Alliance got well over a million people, and what good did it do? Well, 
Yes, th this, is, this, is, this is, you're perfectly, you're, you're perfectly right on that particular point. But it's also a matter that with the different pressures that in fact Gordon Brown is going to inherit a very difficult situation. And that's the situation which, with respect to whatever happens at the end of this month, which it's not going to be a detail. Well, we've been told that it's going to be a broad brush approach, which of course has its details, but the, the problem is going to be in the detail. And this is where the pressure will then need to be exerted at that time. But he's a Scotsman. He don't give a damn about Britain. A well, don't, don't, defeat, don't defeat yourself on this one. It, let, let, let's, let's, you see, if we look at it from a negative point of view, which you are at the moment, because you've been, in, I, I, I suspect you've been involved for a long time, <laughs> and you're damn frustrated on this one because you want to be out and you're not out. Now, the, the dangers do happen in this that we get frustrated and we therefore turn on ourselves. But in fact, the reality is we've won the intellectual argument in the country. Now, that's a major achievement. Having won the major uh, achievement of the intellectual argument, now it's a matter of how do you win the political argument. And this is a very, very difficult potato to deal with. And therefore, it is a matter of the utmost importance to pull together both individually and collectively, and when you hear of something, it might be another group, support them and get others to support locally. But coming back, and I'll deal with your local member of parliament, there is a way of dealing with your member of parliament if you've got, if you've got a number of people like yourself in, the, in your constituency, and if you haven't, try and find some. And the answer is you make a letter, and it has to be a very well-worded well letter, and you make sure you get it into your local papers, because generally speaking, certainly in our area, the local papers will publish things, not in your area, all right? Then there's the next stage. Now, well, uh, that's very interesting. Well, uh, uh, let, uh, we, uh, I'd like to sit down and discuss it. That's ne there's the next stage. What's the next stage if you can't get in the local papers? We do very well in our local papers in our, my part of the world. Um, and, and in fact, I know my, uh, our South Suffolk Member of Parliament must have spoilt his Christmas by one letter in the East Anglian, in the Eastern Daily, no, <coughs> East Anglian Daily Times. It's the Eastern Daily Presses in Norfolk. Um, it was dealing with the post offices, and there was he, you know, getting out, there was a picture in the paper showing how he was supporting local post offices and doing his best and, you know, the usual blah, and underneath was an, a letter from one of uh, our UKIP members, and he's a member of a number of the other organisations as well, with broad headlines right under the photograph, bigger headlines than there was in the article about Tim Yeo, pointing out that the, only, he, the government couldn't do anything out because of the rules which had come down from the EU about it. Yeah. Yeah. Now again, you see, this got out. Now, this is where I come back to your local one. If you, if you can't get them in your local papers, then I, again, have you been in to see the editors of the paper to discuss we it? Are, with yeah. them? Do you know the owners? We have two papers in front of We have two papers. The Evening Herald and the Western Morning News. They had separate editors, but one editor was very like this about the EU. The other one is a pro-EU fanatic. Anti-EU was sacked and the other one does both papers now and you right. can't get anything. Anyway. All right, okay, well let, let, let's deal with this one. I, I, I'd like to discuss tactics because there are a lot more of them, but another tactic is... Well, the question, is, the question is, they're wanting to find how the hell do you get through it. I'm taking the question on myself on this one. Um, <laughs> uh, on this one. The next tactic, frankly, is if, if you've got this, a skillfully put together leaflet without too much information out it and saying what's been done by a large number of people and get it distributed door to door. Why don't we get reports through the local paper? If you start to, this and send it, start to send it to some of their advertisers, why is there a biased view in your paper? Should your business be supporting this? And they'd start to think again. Yeah. Take your advertising away from them. There's, there's lots of tactics. So, you know, keep thinking up new tactics, new pressures, because in the process, you're bringing new reality to more people, aren't you? Yeah. So what do you think Gordon Brown would do about it then? That, let, let's deal with one at a time, and I'll finish this one, and I'll come to you, come to you if I can. Wait, wait, wait and see what's happened at the start with, because it hasn't happened yet, and Gordon Brown's going to be in the trouble. So one, once we've got the publicity on it, let's see it. I can't say what Gordon Brown's going to do, because he, he's a Europhile in, in my view anyway. He's not the, the anti-one uh, that you might think, and I can remember him sitting on the other side of the table when we were at the, at, on the business advisory group, 
and I told him what the views of the small businessmen was on the question of the euro. And he wouldn't look me in the face, he shuffled his paper and said he was looking down all the time. It wasn't until somebody came with his right point of view he looked the other way. So, no, your, your question. Yes. And, uh, and, and so right. We haven't got a single member in Parliament, and nobody speaks up there. We well, when you say single thing in the, in the past forty years, apart from this metrication business. Yeah. When you say you haven't got a single member in, in Parliament, yeah. what, what, who, when, what, what's the we in the single member of Parliament? Who's the we? A, a member that will speak up for the anti-European. Well, the whole of the electorate in the United Kingdom haven't voted for a single anti-European. Well, that's not true. That, a single member in there that's doing any good. Well, I, I would have to disagree with you on that. Yeah, a bit, um, I, I, and I'll, I'll name just two to start with. There's Douglas Carswell, and part of that's come about from pressure in his own constituency in Harwich, and another one is Philip Davies. Both of those, and there are a few others... Who, no, 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 they haven't stopped the treaties yet, but they're, they're, they're sorry to come back on that. I can be as equally frustrated as you. I've been campaigning on these things since I learned about it in 1956. So, you know, it's, when you're dealing with politics of this level, and when you consider the momentum which has been... It's taken us years to get into this mess, and it's, don't expect to get out of the mess in a short period of time. But what you and I... And since a number of us in the same age group of myself, although some look considerably younger, yes, particularly the ladies, of course, um, uh, you, 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 you've got to bear in mind that you are, your constant work is laying the foundation for the right moment when there's the right crisis so that you've got your people on side. And this is why I say it is of such fundamental importance that we've won the intellectual argument. At some stage, some critical moment will come and you've got sufficient numbers where you can go into action. What that will be, I don't, don't ask me, I don't know. It'll come up. But as long as you've got understanding and you keep finding a few more people to get the understanding so you can do something about it, at a critical moment, it'll happen. The Conservatives, to take one example, are in the biggest dilemma. Because they are, well, they're just only slightly the biggest dilemma. They are losing a lot of their traditional people who are on our side with respect to the EU. But there's a lot of Labour people in exactly the same situation, and even a few Liberal Democrats. Yeah. So, you know, this is the situation. And let's face it, Sir so James Goldsmith spent, what did he spend? I, th I think it was about 10 million, wasn't it? I think he spent in advertisements and videos. Um, advertisements in national papers and videos, and you have probably know, noticed that um, Paul Sykes has been doing uh, something similar recently. It was his actions as one man, together with a number of supporters around the, the, the referendum party, as it, uh, as it was at the time, who actually made the major, three major parties say that we we're going to have a referendum, and they spent the rest of the time trying to avoid having to get into the situation of doing it. Yeah. Now that's the tactics which have been brought about. So don't note, we're on the winning side. The reality is the winning point that we're going to win on. What, we're, what we've got to do is keep building the base so that we're in the right position at the critical time. And plus fine tactics. You can, there's plenty of other tactics you can think up on that one. You've been waiting a long time. Thank you, Robert. I will stand up because I always think you know, everyone can see me being five foot, not a lot. I've heard everything you've had to say. What I will say to you is something a local MP to here said to me once. Um, in fact, it was on the 6th of November last year when Sky News was, was trying to tie me down to agreeing to something I hadn't done, which was over that ridiculous email. And Michael Ancrum's words to me were, we are where we are, you have to face it, and then you deal with it. And basically, that's the way I see we are at the moment when it comes to the EU. We are where we are, and we can talk, and we can debate, and we can go around in ever-decreasing circles. But the only way to move forward is to keep talking, but to other people, not just within the same group. Because it's the only way you'll move the vehicle forward. 
and you say about the media and that people don't listen to you, people listen to you if you have a story, if you have something that's close to home, they will listen to you. I'll give you a good story and you can talk to other people about it because I've actually spoken to ITV West, to the tame reporter, and I've asked him if he'll do a small broadcast on it. And I'm trying not to put the political edge on it because that will turn them off. I'm trying to bring the humane interest in. Although I never sent the email last year, I was invited to give an interview to the police because one person decided I offended them whilst listening to me on TV when I was interviewed. I was interviewed on the 6th of November last year, but I was invited to interview in February of this year because CPS couldn't get their act together and get the person's statement to me sooner. It also then took the police another four weeks to try and find an officer who could interview me who didn't know me. Only for the fact of being a local councillor, a lot of them knew me. When they finally found someone to interview me, I was then told I was invited to go in, but of course if I didn't go in, they'd have to arrest me. Not that I've committed a crime, okay? When I got there, I was then told I had a few formalities that were quite normal, and one of them was that they wanted my fingerprints, my DNA, a photograph, and my height. And I said, uh, what for? Oh, it's just formality, and it's in case CPS need it, because if you are actually charged with this, we will need it. I said, well, if you need it then, you get it then, not now. Well, we will actually destroy everything if it never goes ahead. And I said, no, I've heard about this before. Now, if you consider the fact that only if you wind the clock back about five weeks prior to this statement being given to me, I was sat in here and heard about how Germany was encouraging Brussels to try and get us to relinquish as a country all our fingerprints and everything we had on record. Do you remember that? It was a. That's right. And all that flew in my head, and I thought, hmm, I know where this is coming from. I managed to get hold of the guy that was helping me out at the time, who was a barrister on the phone, and I said to him, she wants my DNA, and he said to him, you stay where you are, you give him your statement, you give him nothing else, and stick her on the phone, which is what I'd done. And I didn't have to go ahead with it. But I was cautioned that I may have to at a later date, all because one person thought I'd upset her. As it transpired, the whole case was dropped, but I've never received an apology because they don't have to give me one oh, no. because I wasn't charged. So it brings us back to the media, doesn't it? Here is a perfect example of how you cannot have freedom of speech, how you cannot have freedom of any type. And that would hit home an awful lot more than walking around with a banner because it's a local issue and it could happen to you. It, could, it has happened to me, but it could happen to anybody else. I also want to bring to your attention, you may not have seen it on Thursday night, just after question time. Did anyone see the program that followed about the politics? It's like a politics show with, um, with quite a few nice, interesting people on there. And apparently, Germany is trying to encourage some other countries now, especially France and Britain, to, to change. They're trying to come to terms, aren't they? Not use the word European Constitution, but call it a little mini treaty, because people would accept it more readily. They will only accept it more readily if you allow them to do it. And the way not to allow them to do it is to talk again to your friends and to the media and get it in the local paper. If you can't get it in the local paper, because we have a big problem locally, big, big problem. However, you can get it in in other ways. Got to change the tape. Someone just asked me what was the, the reason why I was charged, why I upset someone, so I will briefly say for those who didn't hear it last time, there was a very, very old um, poem that went around for many, many years. It came out of offices on very badly set typewriters. It then went to computers and places get changed each time, but it's the illegal immigrants poem. And it's all about the British taxpayer. Um, and all I said on the TV, which upset the woman, is that it had nothing to do with me, but it wasn't wrong to say no to people coming into our country that shouldn't be here, and that upset her. So because of that, I should have given my fingerprints and my DNA. 
But we go back to the media. If you go to the media and you keep targeting them with stories, local stories, no matter how silly it might seem, but for instance, the local post office is shutting down and we must all know somebody who can't get to the local post office or somebody who relies on the local post office and it becomes a story. And they start to listen, they see your name in the paper and then you can give other stories and it does actually spread, but it's a matter of time. On a personal basis, I don't feel we have an awful lot of time because once this treaty is agreed to, it's going to be one hell of a lot harder to get out, if at all possible. So I can understand the frustration, but it's still down to talking to your friends and spreading the word, which is something I said to you last time. We stood in the local elections, we defected from the Conservatives, we went to UKIP, there wasn't any members in our town, and yet suddenly we've got an awful lot of members in our town because they're all sitting in the quiet, didn't know they had a collection point of where to go to talk. And this is just the same. So if you don't talk about it and leaflet it in an easy way, which is bold headlines and maybe a cartoon caption. That gets the individual's eye. Lots of words get lost and it becomes too technical and people switch off. But I would like to hear your views on this treaty and where you really think it's going to go because I know deep down inside of me, Blair is hoping we're all going to be so worn down and he's just going to sign it up because that's what he wants to do before he says goodbye to his seat. Well, I think we'll ask him to bring it in from the beginning for the record on, uh, uh, afterwards in a moment. Well, can I just do, do, do answer the, uh, the point before I, before I forget it um, about the, the treaty? Yes, there is no doubt that the German objective and the objective of a number of the elite in other European countries is to reintroduce the Constitution in everything else except for name. In other words, bring the essence of it th there. The reality of the treaty is, of course, is that the large amount of that treaty, which was a treaty for a constitution for Europe, and in fact, uh, the analysis of the whole thing is uh, actually over on the table there. So if you want a good analysis of it, my wife is just holding it up. It's right in front of where she is at the moment. It's very useful because that treaty actually comprises I can't, wouldn't put the percentage, but a, a major percentage of it is already the existing treaties by which we're already bound. It's consolidating it into one document. So what they're seeking to do with the next one and what they're doing on this, whether they call it a mini treaty or whatever else the name they come out with on it, is they're seeking to try and get some of the powers that they haven't already got by the back door and they've done a number by the back door and there are some which I can't name at the moment which they've got hold of which they shouldn't really do and they've used other articles under the treaty so yes they're determined to try and do it but I think Blair does know that if he in fact agrees to, 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 to hand over the vetoes in a number of areas where we've still got the veto to hand over any more powers to Brussels within this treaty that there's problems at home. So, um, and he knows that he'd be creating problems for Gordon Brown, even although Gordon Brown is on side. So once we get a clear message of what's there and we're dealing with the facts and what's being, what's being surrendered, which I, they'll, they'll attempt to surrender something, even if they have to step back, that's the time to start to move on it. Um, I was very interested in what the lady over there was saying and her story, which I think shows a terrific amount of uh, criminal, criminal corruption. Um, don't you think, though, that you should relate this story, any of these stories to the EU and give the number of the relevant directive that's uh, appropriate? The other thing is, um, I, it, you talked about um, to get the information is to be with the people. Well, I, one of the places that's absolutely fascinating is the Fabian Society. I should think most towns have a Fabian Society. Uh, ours is on a Friday night, last Friday in the month in Bournemouth. It's absolutely 
staggering. You can't believe the stuff they come up with. Uh, they've had Harriet Harman speaking, Glyn Ford, MEP for the South West Region, Austin Mitchell is to be the next speaker. Uh, they talk about um, uh, no inheritance passed on, no money, no houses to be passed on to your family, um, uh, um, dis uh, dis what's it of the nation states. It is absolutely incredible what they come up with and it's the best evening you can have. It only costs you a couple of pounds. The other thing is uh, I feel that we've got to do unusual things to get uh, are to get information into the press and I would ask you to come on the 14th of July it's a Tollpuddle March in Tollpuddle uh, we got onto it two years ago with our enormous banner which said um, we want our country back uh, they didn't realize we were there until we got onto the field and we were on the field for about an hour taking a lot of hassle but it got into the local press the uh, Western Gazette reported it for five weeks it set up a terrific amount of conversation uh, to and froing and it was a, 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 a an amazing piece of publicity and I feel that we've got to do unusual things you've got to be prepared to go and sit by the roadside like I do and and do demonstrations on your own uh, all sorts of things you can do but they've got to be something unusual to get the press reporting I did a, a demonstration on the A27 two years ago round about the time of the European elections on my own I don't ask the party I, I, it, they're more than likely to say no to the things that I do so I don't ask them I just go and do it um, and um, I got onto 2CR. It was broadcast all along the south coast as an old lady on behalf of UKIP was doing a demonstration on the A27. I got thrown off by the police eventually, but um, and then I, from there, when I got thrown off there, I went onto the bridges over Wessex Way and I did four days, eight hours a day, four hours in the morning from six till ten o'clock and then I went home for a tin of soup and I went back in the afternoon from three till seven and I stood there all the four days in the boiling sun very windy very uncomfortable but all the time I just thought I have a vision in my head all the time my grandfather was gassed on the Somme and every time I see that war film of that man walking along the trench with that injured soldier over his back I have that in my head all the time and I'll never forget that and that was my granddad there and that's what I do all these things for that's what I'm fighting for and I think we should all do you, you must come to the Tollpuddle March and support us we need a big march and we, we need to come up the other side of the road and meet them because they'll be waiting for us we didn't do it last year because I couldn't get enough people to go but 14th of July uh, Sunday uh, the Tollpuddle March and the last thing is um, Lord Pearson of Rannoch has just said, can't you hear the Jack Boots marching? Yeah. Uh, Robert, Robert, can we just deal with this gentleman was saying about uh, this, this gentleman in the front? Lord, Lord, Lord Ankrum. Sure, it's <laughs> Sorry, it's, um, it was it was it was it was a, meet, uh, a hustings meeting in which Michael Ankrum had been sounding out about the inequities of regional government, which is something we haven't touched on today, but which I feel very strongly. And afterwards, we had a, br a brief conversation when I, I said to him, well, of course, I share your views about regional government and the EU as in general, but isn't it true that we're in this mess because of your mob, as I put it? You got us there. You voted for Maastricht. To which his reply was, well, we all make mistakes, don't we? To which my reply was, well, normally when you make a mistake, you try and rectify it. And there doesn't seem to be much activity in that, uh, that line. He has actually um, apologised. He has actually apologised. Harry's got a little thing there which, which you can read out, Harry. Um, that will be finished off then, I think. Have you got it there? Hmm? Who is that?
Yes, I do. Um, and in fact, there's far more credit unions operating in, in Ireland on the continent than there are here. They are a useful instrument within the existing system. Um, let's put it that way. And of course, you're not likely to have the skullduggery in the sense of foreclosure because you're dealing with your peers effectively uh, on the approach to it. So, yes, I'm, you know, they're a useful instrument within the current system. This is <laughs> just shout. Is it on now? That's it. Right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Now, um, I think we ought to call that to a, a day and thank um, Donald very much. We could go on, I'm sure, a lot longer. Um, Gentlemen, if I may have your attention, whilst this beautiful business of the prizes you're going to win is being done, I would like to give a vote of thanks both to Donald who's come here a long distance in order to give us of his wisdom and also his good lady Jane who's been so helpful at the back selling us all the books. I'm sure, I'm sure we've all learned a great deal this afternoon and it's a great pleasure to have him and listen to the things he can enlighten us with. May I add one little pearl of wisdom for me and that's this that after all is said and done it is the voice of the people which rouses first of all your local media if you get the people out in a large enough crowd they are bound to attend it's part of their emissary if you get that louder still you get the general media coming out and if you get an even louder crescent you get parliament because Parliament fears the voice of the people. Remember that. Thank you.